Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I am Khalid Al Mubarak. I'm media counselor at the Embassy of the Sudan in London. Thanks for uh, a most comprehensive uh, presentation and uh, critiques and notes also. I have one point only, which is Africa does not exist in a vacuum. And the conflicts of Africa are not conflicts which take place in a vacuum. They take place in an international environment, international landscape, which influences them, sometimes initiates them, sometimes promotes them, and sometimes try to stop them. Uh, examples, for example, what's happening in the Democratic Republic of Congo. There are many fingers uh, there. During the Cold War, what happened in Ethiopia and in the Sudan and in, in, in other countries and even in South Africa? Why did, uh, uh, how did uh, the apartheid continue for all these years? It continued because of external factors. So for, uh, I would have liked to hear more about the uh, uh, international landscape, which is uh, not uh, a level playing field. And because Africa is fragile, Africa is a victim in many cases. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll take a couple of more. Kevin. I have uh, one otherwise. Somebody doesn't take my place quickly. Kevin Watkins from ODI. Um, two really brief ones. Um, I mean, one one question. I, I th you know, I think the horizontal inequality work is fantastic, and it really helps us to explain, you know, a lot of the um, social tensions. And actually, Francis and I a couple of years ago had a chance to discuss it in relation to education, and it's it's, it's usually important in that area. But the, the, there are two big questions I have over the, over the broad approach, which is that it. You, what, what's more important here? You know, is it the absolute gap or the perception of the gap, or is it the perception of change? Because you know, when you look at the behavioural literature on economics, that, you know, one of the big lessons that comes out of it is that you know what drives tension is a perception that someone who you previously compared yourself to is all of a sudden pulling away from you and, and doing better than you. So you know, is, is it the is it the gap or is it the is it the change that 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 um, really matters here? And the second question is about you know that one of the findings that you identified is that you know, the devolution is a sort of potential bulwark against the, the, the conflict-inducing effects of horizontal inequalities. And <coughs> you know, in a sense, I find that intuitively right, but substantively questionable because if you look at the reality of devolution in the sub-Saharan African context, most of it is non-redistributive devolution. So, you know, you, you devolve functions down to local governments whose ability to deliver services is constrained by their ability to mobilise resources and poorer communities mobilise fewer resources than richer ones. So, actually, I, I suspect devolution often <coughs> exacerbates horizontal inequalities rather than narrows horizontal inequalities. In which case, I, I, you know, I question the conclusion that, that as, as it was presented there. Great, thank you. Uh, two more here, and then we'll ask the panel to come back. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Hersi. I'm from Somalia. Um, I was impressed with the uh, some the challenges and the the the, uh, the analysis made by Simon of the of the whole landscape of what we are talking about. I have uh, two questions. Number one is uh, on the research research uh, data. If I'm not mistaken, I was seeing only urban urban uh, uh, locations that were mentioned. And personally, I know most of these countries except the two West African countries, uh, and most of their population live in the rural areas, either. Uh, agriculture or, 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 or cattle herding or whatever. Uh, are we now, can, uh, having said that, I can, I, can we say that then uh, these perceptions are the perceptions of uh, politically uh, aware individuals that live in the urban areas? Or can we generalize this in, 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 in such a research? 
So basically what I'm asking is that, uh, is the book or the research is concentrating on the urban area people, or do you think that it is the perceptions of the whole communities that in that country? Thank you. Yeah, number two. Oh, sorry. Um, number two is, uh, there was a mention of that um, uh, one of the uh, um, suggestions of the book, the policy implications, is to have better information of the actual situation. I'm wondering how this would be possible because m information is the monopoly of those who are perpetuating the horizontal inequality. I don't know how then these people will be able to, or maybe I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, conversant enough, but I don't know how, how that would be possible. Or is it one of those uh, <coughs> recommendations that are so a bit theoretical? Okay. Sorry. Thank you. There is one here, and then the last one here, and then I'll go back to the panel because there's quite a lot <laughs> to react to. Hello, my name's uh, Dominic Nash. I'm studying conflict and development at King's College. Um, I was struck by something Yoichi said about how a rise in all the horizontal inequalities um, make violent conflict much more likely. Um, and this question may be a bit beyond the remit of the book, but I was wondering if you turned that round, if in the process of the research there was any sign that violent conflict that had already happened had um, impacted on either horizontal inequalities on a sort of objective level or the perceptions which um, Francis spoke about. Thank you. Thank you. The last one here. Hi, my name is Aul Kulombe, and I'm from Kisima Peace Development Organization, based in London and Nairobi and Kismayu. Uh, there was a report which has been shown by uh, ODI that uh, international NGOs are paying taxi to Al Shabaab, which came in a few days, I think. And what we know is that are we preventing violence because some of these warlords or al-shababs or once you pay them indirectly, which we are, we are not aware. For example, in Somalia, they're being controlled by warlords, and warlords have been been getting tax or money from the international NGOs, despite even the some MBs have been rewarded, I mean, some of the warlords have been rewarded to become uh, lawmakers while they're supposed to be behind the bus. And the Western are ignoring all these things. Today, we cannot go to Somalia because of the threats from the warlords, despite Al Shabaab. So, uh, how can we prevent when we are Western NGOs are paying to these warlords? And are we not? As Simon says, I've been to Rwanda myself and, and Burundi, and once we Western civilize it, uh, promoting, you know, cleaner to be Hutu and uh, supervisor to be Tutsi, what are we making there? Are we changing the things, or we are more case as like Somalia as well? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Let me um, go back to the panel. Should we take it in the same order as the presentation? You can pick and choose a couple each. Um, and I'm sure whoever is left at the end will be we'll like somebody interesting. Please. Okay. Some um, partial answer from a um, political engineer, so <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but the, um, about uh, the... Um, formal institution and informal institution, and ultimately it is people who make use of institution for better or worse, so whether PD or PC, or it, but it's people who make use of it. So, and, um, but the, okay, but um, let me an answer in a biased way. So I, I'm a, so the author of the case study of, uh, country case study of South Africa and Zimbabwe. So, um, I still clearly remember in the early 1990s after the release of Nelson Mandela, so there was the uh, violent conflict and actually apparently ethnic-based, some Zulu and some more integrated urban, you know, 
uh, residents, so the Inkat and the killing, and more than 10,000 people were killed uh, before the, uh, um, the establishment of government of national unity. So I was reading in South African newspaper every day in that period. So, but it was also, also mirror, uh, it appeared like miracle um, the combination of the um, proportional representation in the uh, electoral system and coalition government and ad hoc coalition government and federalism actually saved the country. So um, actually, maybe I might be biased, but you know the um, the informal institution convention and the value is of course important. But sometimes you know we should not underestimate the um, kind of short term effect of the choice of formal institutions. So I think that both are important. This is my point. And then also the South Africa also um, used to be the typical place of um, multiple horizontal inequalities from taking place simultaneously. So the um, socioeconomic horizontal inequality between black and white, and also the uh, political horizontal inequalities, black and white, and cultural status horizontal inequality, black and white. So quite visible and simultaneous. So it was a quite a typical case, and it was very, very violent society, and the country is still struggling on the um, legacy of about eight. So uh, this is quite personal, <laughs> you know, maybe bias on myself. But um, anyway, so. The, and I also want to say the time frame is quite important. So uh, the, at one time, um, I'm a, um, one of the chapter author of chapter two. So I wanted to um, establish, test the uh, relationship um, between um, the uh, people's satisfaction and some the choice of institution. But there was no relationship, actually, um, about the absolute level of satisfaction. But there is no data about change before and after the um, change of institution. So this kind of you know, the uh, data is actually missing. So there's a lot of um, questions about um, the, uh, uh, like Afrobarometer, you know, about identity and also um, socioeconomic political um, horizontal inequality and so on. But maybe we may well ask question about institution as well. And also we, we should be able to compare before and after. So, and not only political institution, but also the horizontal inequality the in general, uh, we don't have much information uh, over time. So uh, I think the, uh, that this time series is quite important. I think we should um, maybe do the, uh, some kind of next similar kind of research, maybe five years later or 10 years later. I think this is quite important. So, and, um, and many questions, but just one, one point um, a, about humanitarian intervention. Um, just yesterday, uh, we had a similar launch uh, event at the uh, um, Brussels, and there was the um, quite high-ranking um, EU official um, in charge of humanitarian in, in response. So, and we talked uh, much about the, uh, you know, a lot of issues about conflict in Africa and all over the world. So there was one thing, and he was used to be the uh, medical doctor. So conflict resolution and conflict prevention, different, but maybe, you know, very much related to each other. So possibly conflict prevention can be, um, you know, internal medicine and conflict you know, resolution or intervention can be a you know, surgical operation. So it must be decisive. We have to choose in a critical condition, but both are necessary. So we agree <coughs> on this. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Francis. Um, yes, thank you for some very interesting, challenging questions. Um, I just want to say about the isomorphic mimicry. I feel we're all you know, pretending to be professors, pretending to be prime ministers. It's a very good description of most of our activities. Um, and I also want to say something about the elephant in the room that we're not allowed to talk about. I th it's my mission, in a way, to, to make this something that people do talk about, because I think it is so important. And you do a lot of things wrong, precisely because it's not talked about. And also that it's measured in a, just a routine way, instead of being ignored, uh, so people do know what's happening. Um, so I, I think it's a bit less an elephant in the room than it used to be. Um, you know, in this country we have the race commission or whatever it's called and it measures inequalities. And in fact, the elephant in the room in this country for that commission was they were told they weren't allowed to measure a vertical inequality, inequality between individuals, because that was politically exclusive, but they were allowed to measure racial inequalities and so on. Um, Lisa, very interesting questions about what's the... <coughs> class and uh, the point about horizontal inequalities is that there are certain ways people organize themselves feel themselves a group 
which might cause them to mobilise. And these could be class, and so you're quite right. But it just happens, I think, and I'm, you know, I'm ready to be disproved empirically, but it happens that in most African countries that's not the way people organise themselves at the moment. They do seem to organise very strongly on ethnicity. You don't find ideological political parties, for example. You find much more ethnic political parties. They do also organise themselves on religion very strongly. So religion is very powerful. Um, now, Latin America, it's much more a question. Maybe some of the movements are class rather than ethnic. That is a mu that's, it's more relevant, I think, there, but it's a very interesting question. Um, the issues about decentralization. Uh, I'm willing to say that, you know, in our presentations, we've oversold decentralization, but I think what decentralization does is precisely disperse rent seeking, and that's very peacemaking. It may not disperse real inequalities, but more people are getting access to the rents. And so they're feeling less resentful about not controlling the central government. So I think even though it might have some undesirable effects even on the aggregate inequalities, I think it is peacemaking. Um, mostly in Africa, it's not been very real. I think it's played a huge role in the solution of the Indonesian conflicts, really a huge role. And that's where it was very, very real, a very, very massive decentralization of money and everything else. So I, I think it can play a role, but um, maybe sometimes it doesn't. Um, post-2015, I'm sort of trying to avoid getting into post-2015, but in so far, I, don't th I think it's in there a little bit. <laughs> if you look at the high-level panel, there's sort of mention of groups occasionally, and there's certainly mention of gender, but it's not really there, to be fair. Um, Kevin's question about, is it the gap or is it perception of change? And I think the answer is both, but we don't have very enough good evidence really to say so. But certainly the gap matters in some countries without any very m big change. But clearly, maybe it's saw some sort of combination. I think it's both. I wouldn't certainly say it's only the perception of change, but I wouldn't rule that out either. And a lot of this work is very similar to Gurr's work who started this much earlier. And his relative deprivation was always a bit messy because it included both and it was never clear which one he was talking about. Mm -hmm. And so he was quite explicitly, you know, it's your relative position to what you expect, to others, to what's increasing, and also to what's happening to others. So it's a sort of combination. Um, I think it was a fair question about urban and rural and so on. I think our sample is basically urban and that's not a national representative sample. And really, we should follow it up with a proper sample in order to be able to make quite sure that what we're finding isn't just a product of the sample. So I think that's a very fair uh, point. And then finally, Dominic's question about uh, does violent conflict actually cause horizontal inequalities? I think it's very case specific. I mean, some places, it depends where the, the conflict is. For example, if you took Uganda, uh, the center was very, very badly affected by their conflict in the early 80s. And the consequence was a great diminution of horizontal inequalities because everyone became very poor. You know, so the North was poor, but it became poor. All right, that was Uganda then. Then afterwards, that conflict was finished and you had the running conflict in the North. And that made the horizontal inequality much worse because the North didn't get any development. So you can see, sort of put together, how it can work in both ways. And I don't think we can say anything very general about it. Great, Lisa. We have a, you can, we have <laughs> some comments. We certainly have a question about doing no harm that we need to get back to, I think. I think actually I'm happy to, to I think we were saying we might leave it for, the, for more questions. If you I mean, do you have any questions or um, any reactions? No, I, I, I enjoyed the question about um, the international dimension of conflicts, <laughs> Thank, uh, which was good. Although um, the fact that there is an inter inter international dimension to many conflicts doesn't necessarily mean that Africa is always the victim because there are many African states who are also sponsoring and, 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 and provoking um, conflicts in, in neighboring countries. But, that, but I think that, that, that was good. Um, Briefly on the on the on the Al Shabaab, it was a colleague of mine who who wrote the paper. So on, on on her behalf, I should say a word. I don't find anything in common between that situation and, for example, um, reinforcing horizontal inequality through through, through through recruitment and through your behaviour, which is basically 
um, adding to and exacerbating because you're playing along with existing horizontal inequalities. I think the Al-Shabaab case is, is very, very different. <laughs> Look, in wars, lots of people have got guns, and some of the people who have guns aren't very nice, <laughs> and some of the not very nice people with guns sometimes use their guns to try and get stuff that they shouldn't have. <laughs> Um, that's what happens in war. And some of the stuff they shouldn't have is stuff that aid agencies want to use as, as humanitarian aid. It should be said that these not very nice people with guns are not necessarily on a side fighting against the government. They might well be on the government side as well. And there are lots and lots of ways in which not very nice governments have got ways of getting money out of aid agencies as well through visa charges and taxes and, and, and so on and so forth and through making sure you employ their people. I've personally been threatened by a government minister you know, on the project, you will employ my, you know, my niece if you want to sleep well at night. <laughs> we, we, we didn't, and I'm, and I'm alive to tell the tale, but that's fine. But, you know, so that kind of thing goes on, and it is a massive humanitarian dilemma. You can see hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, Somalia was a, was a, you know, was a really, really strong case. The, uh, people were literally dying. They needed genuinely life-saving aid. I mean, there are lots of times when you can say, how much was there really? There really was there. And the cost of getting the aid is, well, I've got to talk to these people who I, who I may or may not like. Do I do it? Well, well what would you do? <laughs> huh? what would you, I mean, I, sorry, not a specific question about you, but, but what would any of you do? I mean, it's not easy. I mean, all you can say is sometimes we do things that we wish we didn't have to do in order to deliver the aid, s and we have to think of the consequences. I personally don't believe that the reason why Al-Shabaab was able to carry out some maybe not particularly nice activities. Uh, Al-Shabaab was not a creation of humanitarian aid, and it was not maintained by humanitarian aid. This was kind of small stuff on the side. Yeah? Now, I mean, we know, for example, g going back a while in Cambodia, the, 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 when there were refugees in, in, in Thailand in the camps, everybody knew that certain camps were controlled by certain armed factions. It's the time when the West was supporting the Khmer Rouge at the UN because, it, because of you know, the Cold War and the Vietnamese-backed government. And everyone knew exactly how many percent, what percentage of the food aid was being taxed and taken over into Cambodia for the Khmer Rouge. Everyone knew it. What did you now? At what point do you say, "Sorry, we're actually"? I don't know, but I, it, it's not <coughs> easy. And I think what the report was trying to say, which I, and, and I, I didn't write it, but I, I, but I personally applaud it, is to say, "We all this, this, is, this goes on. We all know it goes on, and the, and it's another elephant in the room. If we talk about it, we can try and make it." better, find ways of managing it, talking among ourselves to see, well, what can we do? And if, and if everyone is silent and pretending it's not happening, we're actually you know, making it much worse. So it was a kind of a call to bring it out. I don't want to say more on that. Great. Thank you. Um, we have uh, a bit of time for an additional round of questions, and I'll ask one before others quickly uh, come in. Um, I was very interested in your findings around uh, the potential and the role of shared um, of, sh of power sharing and the limits of uh, uh, perceived superiority of majoritarian systems and how harmful they can be. Um, I just wonder whether you can say a bit more, particularly if in the case studies in the more qualitative research, what you found about the, what you, I think you refer to the quality of power sharing arrangements and maybe something about the underlying political settlements that determined whether those arrangements were, you know, were effective um, or not. And, and for possibly even for future discussions, a lot of the work that we have done uh, at ODI around the importance of collective, resolving collective action problems and how often they are underestimated in, in development practice, um, it seemed to me that there is, there is a relationship between the potential of these power sharing arrangements and less adversari as adversarials and perhaps alternative models of politics that uh, might work better in some of these um, contexts. Others? Uh, there is one over there and then one here at the back of it. So two on that side. Oh, great. Um, yes, there. And then one, other, Malcolm, one next to you behind you. So uh, do, the, do the panel yeah. have any um, stories about governments that are managing to tackle perceptions uh, and any governments that have successfully turned around politi p political perceptions within their country? Uh, I'm Tom Homer, a student at SOAS. Thank you. I'm Emily Echesa from Save the Children, and I have a few questions. One of my questions is on education. I'm just wondering what is the role of education in 
all this, especially the decentralization. When we look at different countries like Kenya, where the education indicators are slightly better than a country like, let's say, so, uh, South Sudan, which is uh, a new state, just imagine. And the, does the decentralization look different? Uh, are there any similarities and differences that we can learn from? And how do this affect how effective that uh, setup is and how the horizontal inequalities then begin to change for the better. Secondly, I'm also wondering, what is the role of the social media? Because you had indicated that um, the elite always manipulate the media and send the information that they want to send. But we've seen that the, the social media has really started changing the landscape and the youth, uh, most educated youth or uh, medium educated or least educated are using social media in some of these areas, even in rural areas in Africa, especially in Kenya and Ghana and the countries that you highlighted here. And also the link, uh, I was wondering whether you also explored the linkages with this to the political economy debates. There, are, there is a question here behind, two questions here. One and two. Uh, okay. Hello, my name is Fatima Maiga. I'm um, well, international relations um, uh, is my area, negotiation conflict resolution. I just would like to say that uh, uh, the, um, the title of the book is Preventing Conflict, but uh, I did not, maybe it's me, haven't heard more about um, good governance and uh, how to build more how to help build more uh, strong institutions. And uh, because African countries, though um, informal, informal, um, what do call, how do I say, informal sector is, is uh, of good, is of a big importance, but uh, these are countries that we, what, how we judge them, we judge them from how we live here. So they, we should see them as nations um, but I see more, I think I understand more emphasis has been put on to the ethnic side more than on the national, you know, national say, side. We help build as nations uh, more than ethnic group because if we keep thinking and seeing them as separate ethnic group, although this is what they are, how are we, how are we going to have, a, um, how are we going to set a, conflicts yeah. and how are we going to uh, we are going to strengthen them as nations part of you know the world you know world, uh, because our nation we all the nation they have all the same we see them the sa in equally so if we want them to be able to we have to start to see them as a nation and judge them by self. thank you very much can I ask you all to be brief because we are coming to the end of our okay. times and I want to make sure the panel okay. has time I'll do to that respond. thank Thanks. you Thank you for your presentation. My name is Helen Mayele. I'm studying international development and humanitarian emergencies at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Um, I will go back to the issue of decentralization and federalism. I come from Uganda, by the way. I don't know what recommendations you will give for the issue of patronage <coughs> that has really covered the whole issue of decentralization. Uganda is highly decentralized, but it's been distorted by patronage, and then there is massive corruption as a result. Please give some recommendations for that. Then secondly, I don't know if you come across the issue of historical memories of violence in, in your work, but I think it's a very important issue when you talk about violence in Africa. Will you please talk about that? Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, we can take one last one. Um, if there is nobody else. Just, I'm just wanting to make sure people haven't spoken yet have the chance. Okay, quickly. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking of uh, maybe a bit of a provocative uh, question. Uh, is it, are we, when we're talking about conflict, horizontal inequality, is it really the horizontal inequality which uh, causes uh, conflict? Or is it because of the perception of the people and really the thing is uh, access to resources? Because in many countries, in African countries, uh, access to resources also depends how politically uh, connected uh, that, uh, that community is. So I'm thinking really maybe, uh, is it really the access to resources, the, the root cause, 
or is it uh, the horizontal inequalities? Thank you. Um, let me give the last five minutes to Yoichi and Francis to offer some final thoughts and responses. Um, okay. Um, but um, it's quite regrettable. Uh, we couldn't um, discuss all aspects <laughs> of the problem. Um, but the, uh, I think the, uh, my, my conclusion is uh, the power sharing, um, the formal power sharing should be supplemented by informal power sharing. And this informal power sharing and informal institution, all discussion is about culture or education or behavior. So the, um, in, in many case studies, uh, we often discussed about, uh, especially in Nigeria and Ghana chapters, some um, behavior of political leaders, some speaking different languages, and the president visiting local capitals and wearing you know, some traditional costume of different ethnic groups, and also the, uh, some kind of respect, actually the honest respect of different cultures. So this kind of attitude is, is, is quite, um, is a, um, quite is, you know, essentially important you know, as the um, effective supplement to the um, you know, formal power sharing. So this can be um, grown out of the um, education, very good education and multicultural education. This is uh, very much important. And also, um, and I think Francis mentioned, but the, um, the, um, and the, you know, the discourse on governance, um, you know, you often talk about the uh, human rights and you know, the independence of the um, judiciary, accountability and openness and civil society and so on. But um, we wanted to broaden the scope um, to include um, the power sharing and decentralization, but at the same time, the effective decentralization um, could be made sure um, some just you know um, with the uh, some you know the respect of human rights and also accountability and some quite a lot of institutional mechanisms. So I, I think that here again, some both are ne needed. So, um. Yes, I think my uh, reply is very much in accordance with that reply. We're not uh, giving you the entire solution to development, and there are a lot of issues. I mean, for example, corruption is an issue. It's not necessarily a cause of conflict, but it's obviously not, uh, not a good thing to have, and if you can reduce it, that's desirable. And it could even be that in terms of decentralization, it was suggested maybe then what you get is more corruption at the local level. Maybe you do, and maybe you get less at the central level. Some people say at the local level, at least it's more visible because it's nearer to people, so it's a little bit more difficult to have. But be that as it may, that might be something that happens, and we need to tackle that with different policies. But it's not that this poli you know, policies towards horizontal inequalities is going to solve everything. Um, I think access to resources is interesting, and that is certainly a factor, but, you know, it's not... None of these things are the only single factor which counts for everything. There's a multiple... We live in a multiple world, you know, and there are many things which we need to worry about. And access to resources actually turns into one form of horizontal inequality, a rather important one. And I think one reason... Um, it's observed that uh, resource-rich countries are slightly more subject to conflict than other countries, and particularly oil-rich ones. And I think one of the reasons is precisely because it is one group that gets that oil, and other groups resent it particularly because they're not part of that, that particular group. So that it sort of uh, is entangled. The, the access to resources and the horizontal inequalities are entangled. Um, Again, on decentralization, the issue is, is it unequalizing? Well, it depends very much on whether it's accompanied by government redistribution of resources. Good decentralization is so that it compensates the poorer areas. Bad is not. You know, so there's a lot of different possibilities. Um, let me see if there's anything else. Yeah, one very difficult question. Has anyone, have we evidence of turning around of perceptions? Well, I don't think there's been systematic enough evidence on the actual perceptions in the way that they're measured here to say much. I think what we can say is that there is evidence that when a government incorporates people from all groups, it can turn around conflict pr propensity. So in some sense, it turns around perceptions. And I would think that Kenya and Zimbabwe are both very good examples of that both on the brink of real major problems, Kenya having had some major violence, and then brings all the groups into the government, 
and the violence subsides and there's agreement about having a national constitution. Um, just one final point about, you know, is this, shouldn't we be talking about nation building and not ethnic building? And we're certainly not trying to talk about ethnic building. We're saying it's out there and we have to take it into account if we have going to have appropriate conflict reducing policies. But we also believe that you should be doing nation building at the same time and try to make these differences less salient. So it's some, really, again, something that you should do both, not one or the other. Thanks. Any more comments from Simon or Lisa? Yeah. Okay, in that case, it's, I think exactly it's one minute to six, so I'll um, very quickly share a couple of takeaways um, from me. Um, the first, that it seems to me there is a need for a follow-up conversation around the issues of decentralization and devolution, and pos probably bringing together research and evidence in different sectors and in different countries, because I don't think this is about whether it's a good or a bad thing, but to try to get a bit better at understanding um, when it is, because it is the case that when it comes to policy recommendation and solutions, it often features highly as a potential um, solution to many different problems. Um, two more points about data. One is that I do think that this research that looks at user perception-based service and data is very helpful, and I think it does what Simon called for. It, it very, it's very helpful to open a conversation about things that otherwise one assumes just on the basis of what is considered objective data. I do think that there is scope to do more of it and to make sure that the samples get larger so that we are in a better position to understand it. Um, but if, if there is one thing that maybe the 2015 process helps to do is to maybe have more conversation about alternative sources of data and how they can um, be useful to assess progress in different fields. And then finally, again, on data and information, I think it was mentioned before, we definitely need to understand better how information shapes power and, um, and outcomes and get to grips a little bit to what happens when information is available and look behind a lot of the assumptions that are out there about how information shapes perception or in, indeed um, uh, opportunities for individuals. Um, and with that in mind, many thanks particularly to Franz and Yoichi for their presentation and for coming to the I to present this very in interesting book. I'm sure this is the beginning of a conversation. There will be more. And in fact, in late January, we are hosting Mike Wilcock and, and others for other conversations, you know, conversation that will relate to similar issues. Um, um, and so I'm sure I'll see some of you back here very soon. So thank you very much. There is some drinks and some nibbles outside for all of you. Um, which are just appropriate given the festive season. Thank you <laughs> and goodbye. <laughs>